Hello, my name is Danny Nolan and I'm the Director of Chassis and Technologies. Welcome back to this tutorial on tyre modelling. And this is part three of our tutorial on tyre modelling where we've brought it all together. For those of you who haven't gone through and watched uh, part one and part two yet, let me sort of bring you up to speed on what we've done. In part one, we sort of laid the groundwork for everything we were going to do with tyre modelling. In particular, I spent a great deal of time outlining the chassis sim version free tyre model indeed I outlined quite a powerful tool called the Chassis Sim Version Free Tire Model Approximation. Effectively, it's the Chassis Sim equivalent of um, uh, the Pajaco um, Curve Fit Approximations. And we really went through and outlined where all the bits and pieces fitted in and the things that we were um, going to be playing with. Now, the reason we took, a, uh, we took a great deal of time and trouble to go through that is that this basically forms the uh, this sort of underpins the basis of eventually what we're going to be playing with in terms of tire force estimation and tire force modeling. So we really needed to get that bit of ground school done first. Then in part two, we had a look at using the tire model quick start. And the reason we looked at using the tire model quick start is that ultimately the tire model quick start was a, is a very, very powerful and convenient tool to um, manipulate the chassis sim version free tire approximation. And I walked you through some basic steps and some basic controls and uh, gave you some useful tips and tricks for what to adjust with the time model quick start to get the results that we wanted. For example, we played with the init longitudinal, uh, the init longitudinal uh, multiplier to dial in the approximate figures of uh, what we would want in terms of how the car was braking and accelerating. We played around with, uh, or I showed you how to play around with the, um, the lateral uh, camber sensitivity, longitudinal camber sensitivity to dial in sort of uh, changes that you would want in terms of camber. We also played around with um, playing around with different slip angles front and rear to dial in our understeer oversteer properties. And then we had a look at manipulating the traction circle radius properties to sort of dial in uh, particular areas of interest in um, the tire force curve. And we showed you how to look at that in data and then go back and play with it um, in your uh, tire for uh, uh, in the uh, tire force uh, quick start. And really this sort of lays the foundation for what we're now going to discuss to um, how to use tire force estimation and tire force modeling. Now, it would have been very, very easy for us to dive straight into tire force estimation and tire force modeling and say, do this, do that, um, and we all go away, uh, and we all go away happy. But this is a tool, and like with any tool, you really need to understand where it slots in, how to use it, etc., etc., which is why we took such a great deal of time in both part one of this tutorial and part two of this tutorial to really lay the foundation in and to really um, to, to lay that foundation and get you ready for using tire force estimation So, and tire force modeling. So, without further ado, where you need to be up to right now is that by now I'm hoping you would have you would have read the documentation on um, the um, version free uh, on the version free uh, time model. You would have had a bit of a play around with uh, the um, time model quick start. Let's now talk about slotting uh, 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 slotting this into tire force estimation and tire force modeling. Now. Permit me, if I may, to basically once again to go through a little bit of uh, to go through a little bit of ground school, and forgive me for this PowerPoint demonstration for actually not expanding uh, expanding it to full screen. The reason I'm not going to expand it to full screen, there's going to be some things I'm going to highlight with uh, the uh, with the mouse. Now, our first step in our tire modeling procedure is going to uh, use the is going to be the tire force estimation. Now, what we've got with the tire force estimation is the way the tire force estimation works is think of it as like the kid brother of the tire force modeling toolbox. This comes with all ships with all versions of chassis sim. And what it does is with it is that we you we optimize for a simple approximation of the traction circle radius. So we're just simply approximating our traction circle radius is a function of FZ, and effectively what we're doing is we're optimizing this curve purely looking at the car in its static condition. Now, the reason we're doing that is twofold. Number one, it executes very, very quickly. And number two, this is probably your first go-to in terms of, this is your first go-to in terms of, right, 
we've done a really rough approximation using our tire model quick uh, using our tire model quick start we've dialed we've got a rough idea in terms of what the camber properties look like what the um, ellipse properties look like and we've played around a little bit with um, our traction circle radius the tire force estimation is now going to allow you to fill in that key blank of the traction circle radius versus load characteristic, this curve here. So let's go to chassis sim and see how we do that. Now, what I've done is I've loaded my car with my particular setup here. And what I'm going to do, just as a matter of course, I'm going to go into circuit data and I'm just going to load in the um, curvature file that I created for this. And I'm going to load in the bump profile I created for this as well. And I'm just going to go OK. And if I had an altitude road camber file, I would put that in as well, because that's going to become very important for when we start to look at the tire force uh, modeling, particularly when you start playing around with asymmetric cars on ovals. So I'll just commit. What I'm going to do is I'm now going to go to the simulate menu and I'm going to go to tire force estimation. Now, what I'm going to do is I'll click here to import my monster file. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to click here to run the tire force estimation. I click here if the dampers are zeroed on the deck. And if I'm using tire loads, I'll click here if um, the, the, the tire loads are zeroed on the ground. Now, once again, a very key thing here is to make sure that we've got our sign of lateral G correct and our sign of steering correct. What do we mean by this? Well, what we mean by this is if our logger is set up so that a right hand turn is recorded as positive, we have that as plus one. If it's recorded that positive G is in fact a left-hand turn, we put in as minus one. So in this particular example, we had a minus, uh, we had a minus one. Rough rule of thumb, if you get confused, look at a circuit map, then look at your data and look at your lateral G trace and see which way um, it goes. Now, for the sign of the steering, once again, if the steering is to the right for a right-hand turn, that is positive. If it's negative for the left-hand turn, it's a negative. Now, in this case, for this bit of data, we actually had right-hand turns as being positive. So what we now do is, if you've got all that set up, all you've got to do is click on OK. And now it's going to go through and do the tire force um, estimation. Now, at this point, you go away, have a coffee, shake, uh, you go away, uh, um, have a coffee, stretch your legs, then you come back to it. And this typically should take, depending on your computer, anywhere between five and 15 minutes. Now for brevity, what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna um, click here to terminate the calculation so that, um, uh, to terminate the calculation because I've already done this already. But we can see that when it's done, you'll see base, you'll see uh, some optimized parameters for the front design and our optimized parameters for the rear design. Now. Where this is going to be stored is in the same directory that we've stored the car file, which is why in an earlier, uh, which is why in another tutorial, um, uh, my tutorial on tips and tricks for circuit modeling, I always say, uh, I always say that when you're doing your initial modeling, make sure you've got your monster file and your circuit files and your car files all in the same directory. It just makes things for your housekeeping a, a lot more straightforward. So what I am going to do is let me go into my models directory and let me go into my V8 supercar directory and let me go into Phillip Island. And what you'll see is when the tire force estimation is done, it'll come up with this file, opt underscore fnt underscore tire underscore file dot text. And at the rear, it'll come up with opt underscore rear underscore tire underscore file dot text. This is simply a text INR file. And let me just open this up for you. And as you can see here, what this contains is just simply the traction circle load characteristic. Now to load this in, all we need to do is click on, uh, is just um, uh, click the simulation window away, click on the front window, click on the tab that says import V3 ASCII tire, for, uh, 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 tire force optimum results. And I'll just click on this. And all I've got to do is click my optimum front tire, double click on it, and that basically imports in what my optimum tire force uh, file was. Now I'm not going to commit that because of the fact that I terminated that calculation, but if I do the same thing for the rear, I just simply go to import V3 ASCII tire force results. I click on optimum rear tire force file and I uh, double click on that. And lo and behold, 
that's my optimized tire force file. Albeit, I'm not committing that because once again, I terminated the calculation. But that's the procedure. It's a uh, but that is your procedure, and it's as simple as that. That's how simple coming uh, using the tire force estimation file, uh, the tire force estimation file is. And if particularly for um, those of you using chassis sim light, if you really have a good play with the tire force model quick start, and then you combine it with your tire force estimation, you can get a very, very long way with coming up with a very, very representative tire model that uh, you can uh, that uh, you can use uh, that you can use in anger. Okay, uh, uh, that covers tire force estimation. Now, this is particularly if you're dealing with a car that you're really not that familiar with. Tire force estimation is an excellent first step. And as I alluded to before, for those of you using chassis sim light, if you use this in conjunction with the um, tire force quick start, with your um, uh, tire model quick start, you can get an awful long way down the road. Now it's time to talk about what is arguably one of the most useful sh uh, uh, chassis sim toolboxes, which is our tire force modeling. Let me now sort of give you a little bit of a ground school in terms of the procedure we're going to be using for the tire force modeling. Step one, we're going to be creating the 2D model. And what we'll be doing is using the tire force mo modeling toolbox to build on what we've done with tire force estimation. Then in step two, we're going to optimize the camber and slip, ang uh, the camber and slip angle settings. Now, in reality, if you've gone through and you're pretty happy with the stuff that the tire force estimation that's given you, you can actually combine step one and you can combine step two. And what that will do is that will basically, it sort of short circuits a bit, provided you're confident that you've got a really good handle on your traction circle radius versus load characteristic. Step three is to tune in the tire temperature characteristics of um, your tire properties. Now, you'll see here in this particular figure that I've got uh, in in um, uh, this uh, in this particular figure I've got a plot of speed, steer, throttle, tire loads for the front, tire loads for the rear, tire temps for the front, tire temps for the rear. Let me just. Uh, uh, let me just go through and sort of sort of talk about how you're going to tune the uh, how you're going to, um, uh, to how you're going to, uh, how you're going to tune those in. Let me br uh, uh, let me bring up that uh, plot so we can look at it in a little bit more detail. So as you can see here, let's have a look at basically what we're after for the tire temp model. You can see here that the background temperature of the fronts is about 60, for the rears they're about 70. Now, rough rules of thumb. You want the peaks happening between about the 40 to 50 degrees Celsius mark, probably a little bit closer to 40 degrees, but if it goes to 50, it's not going to be the end of the world. Now, what you want is that you effectively want the peaks happening a little bit just after the mid corner condition. And you can see it basically happens just after here for this low speed turn and after this for this low speed turn. It happens a little bit here, but that's one of those really funny corners where it's sort of a double apex corner. So that's one of those suck you wins. Now, to show you where those controls are in chassis sim, your peaks, where you access that as you go and click on thermal properties, your peaks are controlled by the um, heat factor multiplier. So that's your go-to to control the peaks. The lag or where that occurs in relation to the mid-corner condition is going to be controlled by the thermal conductivity. Rough rules of thumb, the bigger the thermal conductivity, the more lag you're going to have. And the physical reason for that is basically due to things like convection, to, uh, to, thing like, to um, things like convection effects. That's why it's sort of, that bit looks a little bit counterintuitive. Um, so the less the thermal conductivity is, the more uh, uh, the the sooner that peak happens, the bigger that is, the less it happens. So really, what you do in step three is that you'll go back to your data, you'll look at 
your plot of this and you're looking for temperature per, of, of, of delta temperatures from your background condition here, which I'm highlighting with the mouse, of anywhere between 35, 45 degrees C. That's a pretty good happy place to be at. Occasionally it will go to go to about 50. That's so uh, that's okay. You will get from time to time some uh, once you start hitting about 60, 70 degrees. That might be okay for a one-off, but I wouldn't really be comfortable with that. A lot, an awful lot of the data I've seen with IR sensors has been in that sweet spot between about 35 to 45. And that's been actually for a wide variety of race cars that I have seen. So that is step, uh, uh, that is uh, uh, that is step three, and it's absolutely critical. You must do that on the 2D model because of the fact that you don't. You want to get that sorted out before you start introducing your uh, uh, before you start introducing your temperature variation, and this point is really really key because it brings us to our last step, which is step four, where we create the three D tire model. Now, when we're creating the three D tire model, all that we're creating is we're create uh, is that what we're all we're focusing on is the traction circle radius curve because that's all uh, because at that point that's all we're interested in so really our procedure is that we start off with the two the 2d model we tune in our camber and slip angle settings we dial in temperature characteristics and then we create the 3d time model okay that's the theory let's now look at putting this into practice Going back to uh, 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 going back to chassis sim, let's now bring up the tire force modeling um, dialog box. Now, the whole idea with the chassis sim tire force modeling toolbox, you'll see here that once again we click here to import the monster import file, and that brings in our steer, acceleration, bump files, and speed files. Now, I might have alluded to I might have alluded to this in an earlier tutorial. But the guts of the tire force, uh, the the guts of the tire force modeling toolbox is that it effectively does track replays, and what it's doing is it sort of turns it a little bit on its head in the fact that what we are going to change is that we simply change the tire model to minimize the error between actual lateral acceleration and simulated acceleration. That's the guts of how the tire force modeling toolbox works. So once again, we fill in the sign of our lateral acceleration and the sign of um, our steering. And as you can see here, we've got a number of key controls that we're going to be playing with. The first control here, which is our tire force optimization bounce, what that does is if I can just, I'll just click away on that on this for a moment. What we're doing with our tire force optimization bounds is if we just click on our traction circle radius properties here, you'll see here that we had bounds of a thousand newtons. So what we're doing here is that we're placing from our start point, which in this case is about at 333 kilos, which is around, uh, uh, which is around about uh, we, uh, which is about the 700 kilogram force mark. We're putting about of a thousand newtons, or approximately 100 kilograms force, slap bang in the middle. We're putting a control of 1,000 newtons between these two points so we're moving this control point plus 15 uh, f plus 500 newtons up minus 500 newtons down and as you can see we do that for all six of those points from our maximum load condition down to what is l on six and we into split and, and we split that over six equally divided points and what that's going to do is it's going to move these control points up and down by the bounds that we've specified in our tire force modeling um, toolbox and it just simply moves those controls up and down and it fits a, a full forwarder curve and it will do this iteratively to minimize the error so that's our tire force optimization bounds let's now we'll walk onto our tire temperature optimum settings now the key for the rest of these settings is that what we do is we specify an initial start point and then we specify a delta range in which to look for. Let's uh, let's um, go through and uh, see how this is how's a, how this is applied for the tire temperature optimum, optimization setting. So you can see here that we've specified an initial optimum tire temperature of 100 degrees Celsius, and this is dictated by the units you've selected in um, view select units to use. So we've selected an initial optimum tire temperature. We've started off a K pre-slope, and we've started off an initial K post-slope. Here, 
when we specified a delta tire temp of 30, what we're saying is we're saying let the temperature vary between 100 plus or minus 30 degrees divided by two. So in this particular case, we're varying between 85 degrees Celsius and 115 degrees Celsius. And look, if you're only doing a very, very minor refinement on what you currently got, the way you tighten that up is you just specify a small delta. And by delta pre-slope, what we're doing here is by 10, we're saying let the search range go between 10 plus or minus 10 on two. So it's between five and uh, it's, a, it's between five and 15. And with the post slope of 20 and a delta post slope of 10, we're letting, let that post slope vary between, to, uh, let that uh, post slope vary between 15 and 25. That's all that basically uh, pertains to. With our slip angle properties, when we're saying a delta of one and one, what we're saying is let the search space start with our initial slip angle, which in, the, uh, which in this case was seven degrees. Let it search between uh, let it search between nine degrees and seven degrees. That's all that pertains to. In terms of our lateral camber properties, you'll see here that we've specified an initial optimum camber of three and a delta uh, and a delta camber of uh, one. Now, in reality. I'd probably, in terms of setting this up, I would probably strongly recommend that you note down once you've got a good idea of um, your initial optimum camber. And as a rough rule of thumb, I start off with a time model. Let's just say on my setup sheet, I'll see, say, a camber setting of, say, maybe six and a half degrees. I'll, because this represents the dynamic camber of where you're generating your optimum ki uh, grip, I would probably start maybe on something like eight degrees and then let it search, um, then set that delta to about two. But that's obviously going to vary from car to car. Now, in terms of my init um, SF cam Y and, uh, and ultimately what I'll talk about, the longitudinal camber properties, for my SF Cam X, I actually will start off on what my, I'll go into my tire model quick start, I'll write down what my SF Cam Y, my SF Cam X is, and my init uh, longitudinal multipliers. I'll have that as my start point, and then I'll specify the search range that I want to look at. That's a very, very key point. So for this particular car, what I would do is I would just simply go back here for our tire model quick start. And this is probably a little bit of an oddball thing because of the fact that it's um, a V8 supercar and some of the tires uh, for this can be a little bit oddball. So I'll start off with a, you'll see here, I've got optimum camber rate, lateral camber sensitivity at 0.2 or SF cam Y at 0.2 and my longitudinal camber sensitivity at 0.2, my init longitudinal at 0.65. So the way I would set this up is I would go back into the tire force modeling and I would set that at eight and eight for the, I probably actually would say eight and eight for the rear. And if I'm doing a bit of a, a sweep, I'll actually go to a Delta camber of two, my init SF cam Y, even though that rough model is about 0.2, I'd probably set it to something like 0.3 and set this to about 0.3 and set my uh, Delta SF cam Y to about 0.2 and about 0.2. So I'm getting a really good idea of where to go in that search space. And for my init longitudinal multipliers, I might go to 0 0.65 and 0 0.65 at the rear and probably take a bit of a broader brush stroke. I might even go to something like 0 0.2 here. My init SF cam Y, once again, I'd start it off on 0 0.3, start that off at 0 0.3, and uh, your delta SF cam Y, probably again about... 0.2 and 0.2. These settings for the mu load slope and delta mu slope, in reality, they're there really for really that final cherry on top. For starting off, I really wouldn't be worried too much about that. And ultimately, if I was um, going to activate that, I would click on OK. But initially, what I would do is I'd set that up as is, and then um, if I needed to double check a few things, I just click on OK and you'll see if we go back to Tire Force Modeling, all those settings are there. So what we'll do, uh, so typically what we do, and to activate each of these components, you just simply click on the tick box. So if I wanted to optimize lateral and longitudinal cambers, I'd click on both of those tick box respectively. Ditto for optimizing slip angles. So. You'll also notice here, right at the very bottom, click here to allow for asymmetric modeling. This is for asymmetric tire force modeling. This is going to come in 
really, really handy for if you need to play with asymmetric setups and you know you've got four very, very different tyres. I did that to devastating effect um, for one of my IndyCar customers um, uh, when we were simulating a, uh, at a super speedway and that proved to be absolutely invaluable. So I would really commend that to you. So let's talk about the mechanics of now driving this um, uh, tyre force modeling toolbox. So. So um, uh, to clear this in, uh, to clear this in hot, I'll click on one, and now to optimize, I click on OK, which now starts my tire force modeling toolbox. Now you can see here what it's now doing is it's going through and doing its thing. Rough rules of thumb, you'll see it comes up with um, it comes up with cost functions around about point two, uh, about point one nine five or so. Rough rules of thumb, you, if that starts to come up with numbers like 0 0.8, 1, 1.1, that's when you go, okay, this is a, the model is as red raw as um, uh, you would like because what that number represents is it represents the, uh, it represents the average error between simulated G and actual G. Rough rules of thumb, to start off on something that's pretty raw, you're looking at about 0 0.4, 0 0.5, and obviously the lower that number is, the better it's going to be. Now, what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna terminate the calculation, uh, and what we'll see is, this is obviously, it, um, and this is effectively what it um, looks like when it's, uh, uh, this is effectively what it'll look like um, when it's finished. But obviously you'll see here, it'll just say uh, optimization. It'll say where's the effect, optimization's done. And like before, if we go back to our directory where um, we uh, store, uh, uh, where we stored our model, we saw this file, which is our optimum front tire force file. Optimum rear tire force file. If we double click on that, that's basically what we've come up with. And if we double click on this, this is what we've come up with for the rears. And to import those results, all we do is click on, you got it, click on the tire force files, click on import v3 ASCII optimum results, double click on that, have a look and see the effect that had. Job done. So that's how we import it for the front. And for importing it at the rear, we click on import v3 ASCII tire force results. Optimum rear, uh, optimum rear results, and we've got the max tire force properties. We click on cancel. There you are. So that's basically how we introduce the tire force estimation and tire force modeling. And as you can see, driving it is not as intimidating as what you'd think. However, once again, let's just go through so we're clear on the procedure of what we need to do of um, our steps here. Okay. Our first step is, the first step is we look at our tire force estimation. Once we're done with our tire force estimation, we then move on to the tire force modeling procedure. Then our four steps for our tire force modeling procedure are step one, we create the 2D model. And step two, we optimize camber and slip settings. Once again, if you're really comfortable with what you've come up with tire force estimation and you've got good correlation, Combine steps one and step two together. What that would look like in your tire force uh, uh, in your tire force modeling is that you'd click on optimize tire loads, optimize slip, optimize lateral camber, optimize longitudinal camber, and then you would switch that to one. Click on OK and let that and uh, let and uh, let that do and uh, let that do its thing. So that's basically steps one and steps two. Once we're done with that, we then dial in the tire temperature characteristics by playing with going, clicking in our tire, going to thermal properties, and changing the heat factor and the thermal conductivity. Just remember, the heat factor controls that temperature peak, and we're looking around about for anywhere between the order of 35 and 45 degrees Celsius. The thermal conductivity controls the offset. Remember, we're after that offset just after the mid corner condition for where we get our temperature peak. So you'll play with that, look at your data, look at your tire temps, and then you'll be able to see, uh, then you'll be able to see where that dials in. Once we've got that dialed up, we then go back to our tire force modeling, click on optimize tire temperatures, set our optimums where we think they're going to be, put in our pre-slope and post-slopes, 
put in our deltas, click on OK, and walk away. This is going to take a couple of hours, so this is probably best left for when you're not going to be using the computer much, so probably an end of the day job, so you can just let it um, uh, do its thing. That is really how we, how we dial that whole tire modeling procedure. So let me sort of tie it all in together. So first things first, get on top of the version free tire approximation because this is the thing that we're really going to be using to uh, as the backbone for what we're going to be doing. You then play with um, your tire model uh, uh, with your tire model quick start to dial in your rough properties. Remember, your init longitudinal multiplier is a really good way of dialing in your traction circle ellipse. You play with your lateral and longitudinal uh, camber sensitivities to get an idea of you, uh, to really dial in of what you want your true camber sensitivities to be. You play around with your max slip angle and max slip ratios to um, dial in what you want to do in terms of understeer oversteer characteristics, and then you play. Then you have a bit of a play with your traction circle radius um, properties to uh, dial that all in. Then you start playing with your tire force estimation and tire force modeling procedure. So concluding, as you can see, it's not all that hard. It's just a little bit different to what you're used to, but I guarantee you, once you get on top of what all these, uh, what all these elements mean, and the significance of how to tie all these together, you're gonna be doing this in next to no time. So my challenge to you now is to get out there have a look at some data and have a play with this for yourself. And if you use the framework that we've just discussed, you're going to be coming up with um, tire force models in next to no time. And you're really going to get to the point where you can use the tire force modeling uh, a tool, such as a tire force estimation and tire force modeling toolbox as real tools to not only dyno your tires, but to get on top of what they're truly doing. And this is going to put you in such a strong position to uh, engineer the race car.